pi minus a special kernel. Oh, sorry. I need a chi bar A. K. Two to one. Chi bar A. It takes a sec to write this thing. On an extended L2 space. So here we've got um, x1. Chi bar A is the thing which in the x oneth coordinate is the indicator function that the underlying variable, which I shouldn't call x, I guess I'll call it u, is less than a i. So that it's a vector of indicator functions. And k 2 to 1. <laughs> of x1, u1, x2, u2 this is going to take me the rest of the blackboard to write. OK. So we don't want to see too many of these. Uh, in fact, I was foolish to start there. The integral. I'm going to write this thing, but don't, don't take it. Don't worry that it's a bit complicated. Now, this is the airy function. So these are like the formulas that Pierre was writing, but he sort of referred to me that I was going to write them all down. <laughs> okay, and then there's another term which looks pretty similar. Okay, I'll write it out. I just want to show you one so you get the idea. X1 cubed minus X1. In this term, there's a plus there. I don't want to bore you with these things too many times in these talks, so I'm just going to do it brutally once. OK. Any typos? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No bars. Oh, yeah, sorry. Everything else right? Anyone in there who says a minus sign is wrong? OK. <laughs> what, what, what do you get from something like this? Well, you see, OK, there's a formula, OK? These processes are specific processes whose finite dimensional distributions are given by some specific formulas, right? Number two, the formulas are quite complicated, OK? They're never much easier than this. They can be written in all sorts of forms. If you open a book for the area 2 to 1 process, you might see a different formula. And you'd have to sit there for two hours, maybe, and just check that it's the same formula. Or it's even worse than that, because determinants are invariant under conjugations. And you might have to conjugate it to get to the formula you want. So it can be kind of a nasty business. And it's not too clear which formula is the same as which other. OK. One can check. So again, this formula is obtained by getting an exact expression for TASEP starting with this initial data, which we'll see tomorrow how those expressions are obtained. But it only works for these three data, basically. Or, or I'll show you which ones exactly it worked for. 
Um, and then doing a scaling limit to, to obtain that. So you do a scaling limit of the determinant formula you get for this with this scaling, and you get this formula coming out. So, and one can check that um, this uh, area, two to one, process x. And now, now you have to shift, if, if you want to get, um, goes to uh, area two of x. So I've shortened it, I've just called a sub two of x. As x goes to minus infinity, and area one of x, as x goes to infinity. But it, not exactly that, actually. If you think about it, under the scaling limit, what you see when you take a limit of this, under the scaling when t equals zero, there's only an epsilon one half, but you're doing epsilon minus a half. So the thing converges to a wedge. That's your initial data, a wedge. Okay. And from the wedge, you should see something that looks like that. Okay. And so this area one to two lives there. That's what you're seeing. Okay. And so here you actually have to subtract, or add, sorry, uh, the smaller of zero and x squared. That's that parabola that you're seeing. Okay. Okay. So here the initial data is um, h. The, the rescaled initial data, this guy here, is h zero of x is minus infinity. x negative and zero. That's the rescaled initial data. Okay. All right. So, so what we have in our, in our pockets is actually um, a couple of different area processes. There's this area two, area one. There was the one Pierre mentioned called area stat, if you start with Brownian motion. Area stat's a funny process, because area stat is just a Brownian motion in space, but it's got this funny height shift of a, of a bike range distribution at zero, which is coupled to the rest of it. Um, and then you also see that you could start with one on one side and one on the other side, and get a crossover area process. So you can kind of stop at zero, put one of them on one side, so you could do stat on one side and a two on the other, and you get an area two to stat process. So there's sort of six of these guys, six basic area processes. All with their own crazy formulas to make you insane. Okay? Now that's the story. So, it's not too hard to imagine, if you look at this, that what's really going on, because it remembers the initial data, but otherwise it's universal, supposedly, over all these different types of models, is that really the rescaling is sending you to a universal fixed point in the space of models. So we've got all our models, like um, um, TASEP, or KPZ equation. or directed polymers, directed random polymers. Or stochastic burgers. Stochastic Hamilton-Jacobi equations. Or as Pierre was mentioning, the 
fronts of 2D chemical reactions, so we would have stochastic reaction diffusion equations. Diffusion fronts. And then there's this rescaling, each epsilon equals epsilon to the one half h, epsilon to the minus three halves t. X. Perhaps minus some huge constants. And all these models under this renormalization are being sucked into some universal fixed point. which has special self-similar solutions, which are these area processes. And that thing is the KPZ fixed point. And the KPZ universality conjecture is that all the models you believe are in the KPZ universality class will, under this rescaling, converge to this KPZ fixed point. So this is a picture of the KPZ universality. It's a vague conjecture because What's the definition of being in the universality class? <laughs> but keep in mind that the, the points in this space are, are, um, are these dynamical objects. So they're usually Markov processes. You have some initial data, and it's a Markov process telling you the mechanism of evolution. So these points are Markov processes, and they converge to this KPZ fixed point, which should itself be a Markov process. They're not all Markovian. If you look at the fronts in a stochastic 2D reaction diffusion equation, you don't know what that is, don't worry. That's definitely not a Markov process, but somehow the Markov process gets recovered in the limit. Okay. The problem with this universality conjecture <coughs> is that until recently we didn't know what the KBZ fixed point is. So the subject of this lecture is that I'm gonna basically tell you what's the KBZ fixed point. And um, the way to get it is to solve TASEP and take a limit. So this limit now, so I should write it in red or something. This is completely understood. Okay, so at least one. And then there's a couple of other models like TASEP. TASEP has some friends like things called push TASEP, et cetera, which we won't get into. So there's a couple of other models. There's like five other models which are sort of friends of TASEP, which also work. Okay. Now, in this picture, um, the KPZ equation looks like it has no special role, anything more than TASEP or all those other models. And that's true. In a sense, it's not even a special model. It's just a nice one because you are allowed to do this, and we all like continual models and things like that. Though it's bad, on the other hand, because it's so ill-posed. But it, it does play a special role because of this fact that on small scales, it just looks like this. So what happens with the KPZ equation is that if you look on large scales, it should go to this fixed point. But if you look on small scales, it should just go to dt h equals dx squared h plus c, this linear equation. So that's another fixed point, a trivial fixed point, in the universality class called the Edwards-Wilkinson. Fixed point. This guy has this one, two, three scaling. So the KPZ fixed point, just by fiat, if it exists, is invariant under this one, two, three scaling. The Edwards-Wilkinson is invariant under this one, two, four scaling. Okay. 
And then there's a sort of weak universality of the KPZ equation, that it's the only thing, it's the, it's the unique, the conjectury unique heteroclinic orbit connecting the Edwards-Wilkinson fixed point and the KPZ fixed point. And if you start with models with adjustable nonlinearities like ASAP, so in ASAP, part of, you don't only just jump down, you can jump down or up. And if you make the rate of jumping down close to the rate of jumping up, that's the same thing as tuning the asymmetry small. And if you tune the asymmetry small, you can see that if you, if you tune the asymmetry small here and put an epsilon one half here, then you would already be in the one, two, four scaling. So there's models like ASAP, which if you tune close to, um, with um, uh, asymmetry small, will converge actually to the KPZ equation under this one, two, four scaling. So I just want to mention that because there's also that universality, which remains to be proved for a lot of models, though a lot of progress has been made because Martin Hare's method actually allows you to do this in a lot of cases. Um, but that's a very different universality than the real KPZ universality conjecture, which concerns this KPZ fixed point. So um, this, is, this is the weak universality of the KPZ equation. Okay, great. So I have eight minutes, and I'm going to tell you what's the KPZ fixed point. And <laughs> I don't know if you'll be appalled or, uh, or wanting to come back for more, but anyway, <laughs> here it is. Okay, so the KPZ fixed point is a markup process uh, with explicit like that, uh, determinantal transition probabilities. Its state space is a little bit funny. Did I erase this thing? Oh, shoot. OK. Its state space is a little bit funny, because um, although you'd think its state space would just be evolving height functions, you can see that under the KPZ scaling, this is just going to converge to what? It's going to converge to um, something that looks like this, right? Converges to that function. And this guy converges to that function, right? Does anyone see that? So its state space is actually naturally consists of upper semi-continuous functions. So the KPZ fixed point. a markup process. On UC, upper semi-continuous functions. Upper semi-continuous functions have a natural topology, because for a function to be upper semi-continuous just means that it's hypograph, that means all the stuff left than it, less than it, which I just drew there, is closed. So if the hypograph's closed, those are closed sets in the plane, and so you can take a distance, which is just the Hausdorff distance. Okay? But we only want to do it locally. So the, the metric, so the, the topology on these functions is local Hausdorff convergence. Local Hausdorff topology. That's very natural because if you take this initial data here, so that's your initial function. Because of the lateral growth, of course, it's going to grow to be like that. Okay. So that's why Hausdorff is the right topology here. Okay. If you start with some function f, this is the probability starting some, from some function f in UC. And now you ask the question, at time t later, what's the probability that h is less than or equal to some new function g? Okay, that means less everywhere. So there's some function g, and you just ask, is it less than that function? And this will be given by a Fredholm determinant, i minus some operator which is constructed out of f and g, which I'm going to show you. 
the operators have names. They're called k hypo f. Now I've got to get the times right. T over 2. K epi g minus t over 2. And this whole determinant is being calculated on L2 of R. So the whole thing's being hidden inside these operators k hypo and k epi, which I'm going to describe to you now. Okay. They're a little bit weird. Okay. Well, first of all, epi refers to the epigraph of g. And it's completely natural, because if I ask for a function to be less than this thing, and we were talking about upper semi-continuous, it's completely natural that g should be lower semi-continuous. So g's are just minus the f's. And in fact, the hypo operator is just the epi operator observed from above. So kt hypo f is nothing but rho. So rho is the reflection operator. So rho of f of x is just f of minus x. So it's nothing but rho k minus t of epi minus rho f rho star. So anyway, they're, they're basically the same operator, but one's being looked at from above and one's being looked at from below. Okay, I, I could almost have written that, but I wouldn't have space. Okay. Now, to build k, we need to write down some operators. It's just going to take a second. So we start with the following things. Stx is the following operator. So this one, e to the x d squared. So that's just the heat semigroup, right? d squared is just the second derivative operator. So this just means the heat semigroup, except there's a bit of a twist here. Uh, you were told never to write the heat semigroup backwards in time, but x is in R. But it's OK, because we're going to add on t over 3 of d cubed. And d cubed saves you from the backwards heat equation. So believe it or not, this operator makes perfect sense. And in fact, it has a simple integral kernel. Well, simple enough. It's t to the minus a third, e to the 2 thirds. You might start seeing things which look familiar. x cubed over t squared minus zx. If you can't read this, it's in the notes anyway. Airy of minus t to the 1 third minus a third z plus t to the minus 4 thirds x squared. OK. If you can't read it, don't even worry. The point is, it has a nice integral kernel. And amazingly, because you're solving the heat equation backwards, the kernel is explicit and nice. It actually behaves well as x goes to minus infinity, if you look. As x goes to minus infinity, you get e to the minus x cubed. It's very bizarre. OK, so now I have to tell you what the k's are. So you'll give it five minutes. One minute? Ivan. <laughs> Let me at least finish this. OK. OK, so I have my function g. And g, g is an upper semi-continuous function, so it sort of looks like, oops, not like that. Well, OK, it could look like that. There's an upper semi-continuous function. OK, that's g. You should think about it as being identified with its epigraph. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to split somewhere at a place called x. I'm going to send a Brownian motion until it hits the epigraph. 
Okay, and that's called tau. So x is a x is a position on here. It's in a Brownian motion from a position uh, v until it hits the epigraph at time. It's called tau. It's time. It's a time. It's a position in space. And we'll send a Brownian motion this way too. Maybe it'll hit the epigraph there. Okay. So we make an operator called S bar epi g plus x. So this, this side of x is called g plus x. g plus x. That just means g on this side. And the g, g minus x just means g on this side. g x v u the expectation of a Brownian motion starting at V of S T X minus tau B tau U. That operator is called epi. And then there's a similar one on the other side with the same definition. I'll keep that. And here, One of think of this as a hit operator. Running in motion hit the thing, and then we evaluated S at that. So this thing, this thing's called the Brownian scattering operator. Take I minus S minus T X minus S. By the way, S can have minus T or T. The, the T here can be any sign, and it makes sense as long as T is not equal to zero for all X. Minus T. So you should think of this operator as saying, I don't hit on the left. Gx and S minus T minus X minus S bar epi Gx plus minus T. Ah. Minus X. OK. And that says I don't hit on the right. And you should read I minus that as somehow a particle gets sent in from infinity at one variable. It's, it's an operator, but it's an operator kernel also. So it has two variables, u1 and u2. It gets sent in from infinity at u1 and has to hit g and then exit at infinity at u2. And that's the Brownian scattering operator. You compute that. Put it in here, and that's the, this is the KPZ fixed point formula. You can do that for any function, and that thing gives you exact transition probabilities of the Markov process. Unfortunately, I'm out of time, but although it looks like a crazy formula, in fact, if we were in this case, in five minutes, you'll get this formula out of it. All you do is just evaluate, because if you're in this special case, one side is flat, and the other side is like this. So hitting on one side means you don't hit at all, because there's nothing to hit. Hitting on the other side means you're hitting a straight line, which you can do by the reflection principle. You just compute, and out pops this formula. So although the formula looks very abstract, it readily reproduces the known formulas, okay? And then, well, of course, the big question is, where does this formula come from? And that's going to be the subject of the next three lectures. Okay. <laughs>
I think uh, since we're running a little late, we'll save questions for during lunch and the subsequent ones. Let's thank Jeremy again. <laughs>